My name is Ann Wilkie, and I will be your presenter for today's webinar. Dicentra is a leading international scientific and regulatory consulting firm with expertise in bringing product concepts to realization in the marketplace. We can help you with product formulations, product licensing, site licensing, compliance issues, clinical trial applications, advertising reviews. We can help you for, with everything involved with foods, natural health products, drugs, cosmetics, and medical devices and bringing them to the sale in Canada. For further information, please visit our website or email us at info at dicenter.ca or call us at 1-866-NHPEZ. We are providing these webinars to stakeholders free of charge. This is part of our commitment to stakeholder education as well as to the successful implementation of the natural health products regulations. <clears throat> the objectives of the webinars are to provide you with up-to-date information pertaining to the implementation and interpretation of the natural health products regulations in Canada, as well as to provide you with other scientific and regulatory information that has relevance to the natural health products industry. Today we'll be looking at uh, the food regulations and some of the changes that are helping in the, happening in the food arena, which may have an impact on natural health products. And as well, starting with today's webinar, we're going to take a look at what's happening in the United States in terms of the dietary supplement market and some of the compliance challenges they are facing south of the border. So we've been very successful. We've had over 100 companies signing into these webinars. And based on your feedback, we've been continually trying to improve our webinars. So just some technicalities with regards to today's webinar. Everyone is on mute, hopefully, so I hear some scratching in the background, so I'm not too sure. But unfortunately, we are not able to offer a question and answer series just because of the large number of participants on this call. There will be a recording of the session available tomorrow on our web, sorry, within several days on our website. As well, all the links that are mentioned in this webinar will be available in a clickable format. So that was another concern of participants that weren't able to click on the links as the presentation was moving forward. So as I say, the links will be available on our website, as well the PowerPoint slides will also be available for your download. So in order to improve on our, our services to you, we would appreciate it if you would take the time uh, before the end of today's webinar to complete the survey, which should be showing up in the chat box to the right. Now moving forward, this, today's webinar should take about 30 minutes, and we do have a guest speaker at the end of the webinar. Topics that we will look at, the current regulatory environment, consultations and regulatory initiatives that are on the go. We'll look briefly at the status of applications quarterly report, look at new guidance and tools for the industry, product and ingredient information, changes within the site licensing arena, activities of the Natural Health Products Directorate Program Advisory Committee, some of the more recent communications that have come out from Health Canada with regards to natural health products, and then as I mentioned, we'll look at some of the initiatives that are happening within the food regulatory environment, as well as what's happening in the United States with dietary supplements. Then, as I mentioned, we will have the Consumer Product Safety Act update from Joel Toller, who is a partner with Gowling's law firm. So if we're looking at the current regulatory environment, the key changes that we've seen in the last few months is, is that the, uh, the arrival of the new Director General at the Natural Health Products Directorate. Michelle Boudreau was the former Director General. She left a few months ago. And Scott Soller has now taken over the, the lead at the Natural Health Products Directorate as of the end of 2010. Uh, Scott has been making himself visible. He has been out speaking at association meetings and also holding meetings in his offices in Ottawa. I think everybody is getting to know Scott. He was actively involved in the initial stages of the natural health products regulations, working with the association. He was involved in working groups with GMPs and standards of evidence, et cetera. So he has a fairly good background within this arena. So we'll wait and see what happens. The other staffing change of significance and possible impact to the industry is that there is a new associate deputy minister within the health products and food branch. This is Mr. Paul Glover. He replaced Ms. Mina Ballantyne, who has again moved on to other areas of interest. So right now, I, I would think with these two new people at the helm, we won't see any significant changes 
in the near future. I think it's more of a transition time and each getting familiar with their new roles. So just a few comments. We're all familiar with the Natural Health Products Unprocessed Product License Application Regulations that came into effect in August of 2010. This was a process to accommodate the large number of applications that were still sitting with the Natural Health Products Directorate in some since 2004 that had not yet received a licensing decision. So the UPLAR regulations allowed for the issuance of exemption numbers to products that did not meet risk criteria, specific risk criteria, and that it had not received a licensing decision from the Natural Health Products Directorate 180 days after they had received their submission number. So as of yesterday, there was close to 10,000 products that had received exemption numbers. When UPLOR came into effect, there were close to 11,000 applications sitting with the Natural Health Products Directorate. So approximately 90% of the applications that are in queue will be covered by UPLAR, meaning they are eligible for exemption numbers. The applications that are in, which NHPD no longer refers to as the backlog, but the applications that were received prior to the introduction of UPLAR, they are being reviewed uh, based on their claims, their ingredients, uh, the date the product license application was received. So they are being reviewed, however, there are no performance standards associated with these applications. The only sort of performance standard is that they need to be dealt with by February 2013, which is when the UPLAR regulations are deemed to, uh, to be sunsetted to end. So they need to deal with these applications. As of the end of December, they had dealt with 25% of these 10,000 plus applications. So they had either been licensed, uh, withdrawn, or refused. So they are moving forward. As I say, they've completed 25% of these applications by the end of December. Uh, one other comment just before, sorry, we leave UPLAR. Uh, there are some uh, questions about the benefits of refiling these applications. As I say, if you've had an application in queue since 2005, six seven, eight, uh, and they're still with the Natural Health Products Directorate, the only deadline that NHPD is looking at is 2013. So you may want to consider refiling your application, particularly if it would qualify uh, to attest to pre-cleared information or a more recently issued monograph. At least by that token, you would have performance standards that the government would need to review your application. The compliance and enforcement policy, we're all aware the revised policy came into effect August 27th of 2010. We are still in the education and promotion phase. Initially, full enforcement was to take place in the beginning of February, then it was March 1st. Now it's been put off indefinitely. So we're still in the education and promotion phase. There's been no indication of the new timelines, what we might expect though given that the majority of products will qualify for exemption numbers and that there's been approximately 25,000 product licenses issued, we may be seeing compliance sooner rather than later. But again, no firm dates have been set out there. The only thing that we know is most likely there will be a phased in approach with the first deadline being for manufacturers, packagers, labelers, and importers to have their products licensed or with an exemption number and then six months later, the expectation for retailers and distributors to have cleared their, uh, their distribution systems of non-compliant products. So currently, submission numbers will still gain you access to the marketplace as long as there's a valid site license associated with that. So some of the consultations and regulatory initiatives that are currently ongoing. One is with respect to salvia divinorum. Health Canada is proposing that this herb and its main active ingredient, salvinorin A, be added to Section 3 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. If this doesn't it does indeed happen, you would be prohibited from possession, trafficking, possession for the purpose of trafficking, importation, exportation, possession for the ex purpose of export and production or cultivation. These would all be deemed illegal activities regarding salvia divinorum. So this is actually a species age that belongs to the mint family. Its leaves are generally chewed or smoked to obtain psychotropic effects. And that's where the current concern is coming in, 
that it is being widely promoted on the internet as a legal hallucinogen for young teens and young adults. So other countries have making a move to restrict um, the use and availability of this herb and Canada is looking to follow suit. But they're also aware that there may be some legal, legitimate medical, scientific or, or industrial purposes for this herb and are looking for input from the industry. The next consultation that is ongoing is with regards to hepatotoxicity of health products. So this includes drugs as well as natural health products. This is a draft document, draft guidance document that has been put out by Health Canada to provide guidance to sponsors to facilitate the detection, assessment, mitigation, and reporting of hepatotoxicity induced by human health products prior to them getting market authorization. Uh, history, we've seen issues with hepatotoxicity in CABA, for example, or with mainstream drugs such as acetaminophen. So the consultation on this draft guidance document is open from February 16th until May 17th of this year, and you can submit your comments to the Policy Bureau at that email and fax number. With regards to adverse drug reaction reporting, and this is a specific amendment to the drug regulations, not to the natural health products regulations. Uh, it was published in part Canada Gazette Part 2 on March the 2nd, again amending the adverse drug reaction reporting requirements in Part C of the regulations. It requires manufacturers to notify the minister when they identify significant safety signals in their annual summary reports. And as well, these amendments will clarify the minister's ability to request case reports or summary reports and will require that manufacturers maintain records of these reports for a minimum of 25 years. So this is in response to the fact that currently the Minister of Health has a limited ability to require the results of annual summary reports be provided to Health Canada. So it's just strengthening their, their ability to access safety summary reports. And as well, in terms of enforcing the regulations, again, it's the uh, clarification of the expectation that res records will be maintained for 25 years. These changes are effective February of this year. And again, the link is there where you can find the regulatory amendments. In response to this, primarily in response to this regulatory amendment, Health Canada has updated the guidance document for industry entitled Reporting Adverse Reactions to Marketed Health Products. So again, you can find this under the What's New section of the MedEffect Canada website. This replaces the 2009 guidance document, and this is also effective March the 2nd, 2011. And again, these guidelines just provide clarity to stakeholders in terms of what's expected from Health Canada with regards to reporting adverse reactions, recording them, investigating them, and preparing your annual summary report. Also in line with that, there have been some updated forms with regards to mandatory adverse reaction reporting. These are posted, again, on the Health Canada website. The links are there, and these uh, updated forms were all posted in January of 2011. So there is the mandatory adverse reaction reporting form for industry that's been modified. The Canada Vigilance Adverse Reaction form reporting form has been modified, as well as the consumer side effect reporting form. We're just going to look briefly at the status of applications quarterly report that comes out from Health Canada. Uh, this uh, is for quarter three. This is in terms of Health Canada's quarter three, so we're looking at October 1st to December 31st. Again, just a general summary of the numbers. As you can see, we continue to move forward since January 1st, 2004, when the regulations were first implemented. Health Canada, the Natural Health Products Directorate, has now received just over 57,000 product license applications. The numbers in brackets refer to the second quarter. Uh, sorry, the numbers that were identified in the second quarter report. There's 47,000 assessments have been completed, so 83% of the product license applications have either been uh, resulted in a licensing being, license being issued, the product being withdrawn or refused. Uh, 
25,000, almost 26,000 product licenses have been issued, representing close to 35,000 products. So that's not a bad number. Over the last uh, six, seven years, 35,000 products are now licensed, uh, together with close to 10,000 products with exemption numbers. And again, we can see that it, additional companies continue to come to the marketplace. 1,326 companies have received, oh, sorry, that's received a product license compared to 1,258 companies in the last quarter. So there are new companies coming into the Canadian market. In terms, uh, these quarterly reports have now been broken down into pre uplar activity, so prior to August 4th, 2010, and post uplar activity. So since August 4th, 2010, uh, Health Canada has received 4,194 applications and amendments. This is compared to the end of second quarter when they had four applications. 48% of these applications meet PCI requirements, so they are entitled to a targeted 60-day uh, performance review. According to uh, communications, uh, Scott Soller, the Director General, was at a, an association meeting the other day, and he said for these applications, there is a 78% approval rate for applications attesting to pre-cleared information. Three quarters of them are moving forward with licenses. Again, in terms of meeting performance targets, the Natural Health Products Directorate is issuing their application acceptance letters within 30 days, 96% of the time. And for compendial applications, they are meeting their regulatory requirement of a 60-day disposition 98% of the time. So again, the, the emphasis is on the post-UPLAR product license applications because the government has proposed their performance targets Again, the regulatory requirement, 60 days for compendial applications, 60 days for applications attesting to pre-cleared information, and 180 days for all the non-pre-cleared information applications. So they are on target uh, with the shorter time frames. They didn't release any um, compliance with the 180-day timeline, which is sort of interesting. Uh, this is another... <laughs> A new statistic that has been put into the quarterly report, these are in terms of applications that don't even get into the review system. Since, so since August 4th, 2010, 175 applications have been rejected outright. This is when they get in, just get to the door of the Natural Health Products Directorate, there's a preliminary screening, and they are rejected. So these are the reasons, sort of interesting, 34% were missing a signature, so neglecting to sign the application. 23% of these applications were lacking the third-party designated authorization form. 18% of these applications were lacking contact information, was either missing or incomplete. 13% uh, of these had an issue with the electronic application, so not meeting the requirements, uh, whether it was submitting a CD without a, a, a signature or the attestation code. And then for 3% of these app patients, no application type was identified. So again, this goes back to the application management policy where the NHPD is becoming increasingly strict in applying, uh, in accepting only quality, complete quality applications. Again, just some comments on the site license application. Again, continue to see new companies into market, ones that are involved in either manufacturing, packaging, labeling, or importing. So the NHPD has now received uh, 1,711 applications for a site license since January 2004. They're at a 97% completion rate, uh, 1,119 licenses issued, and close to 2,000 renewals have been received, and again, their renewals they've got 95% completed. So the licensing side seems to be moving along much more smoothly than the product licensing side. And the other area of interest is the number of clinical trial applications that have been received, most likely in response to the NHPD's uh, mandate to have human data to support safety and efficacy of applications. So 322 clinical trial applications have been received by the Natural Health Products Directorate, and 94% of those have been completed. 
So only about two-thirds of those uh, clinical trials are actually proceeding. So some new guidance and tools for industry. The first one we'll look at is the electronic product license application and the NHPD has indicated their commitment that eventually this will be the only way that product license applications will be accepted. Currently, you can still submit them in paper form or you can submit it on a CD, but eventually the electronic PLA online system will be the only way to submit your applications. So currently, 40% of applicants are actually using the EPLA. In response to this, Health Canada has uh, published their Natural Health Products Online Solution, an electronic product license application form user manual. So this manual will help walk the applicant through the process and help ensure that they are meeting all the requirements for the complete submission of the electronic PLA. So again, if there's any questions, you can view the, the user guide, the manual at this web link, and any questions can be sent to the NHP initiative. The other component that's recently being introduced is the Natural Health Products Online eSubmission Builder. So this is a, a program that can, a software application that can be downloaded and installed on the user's computer. It will help you create the complete submission electronically. So not only the EPLA form, but it'll also help you attach all the associated documents that need to go uh, together to form a complete application. So the third-party designation form, the animal tissue forms, uh, the safety and efficacy information to support the application. So again, this is a, a user to help walk the application to the process and ensure that they understand the requirements and how to use the submission builder so that you can submit all your information online. Moving on to product and ingredient information, not a lot has changed since the last time we presented our regulatory update webinar. Again, these products continue to be on hold uh, pending regulatory decision or guidance within the Natural Health Products Directorate. So weight loss, weight management products are on hold. There is a working group that has been convened uh, with industry, academia, health practitioners to look at the category of products and to make recommendations for moving forward. Uh, we're expecting that the proposals will go to the uh, Program Advisory Committee to PAC shortly. They will in turn make recommendations to Scott Soller, and hopefully there will be a guidance document that will be coming out to stakeholders for comment uh, in the near future. Again, enzymes are still on hold pending an internal decision. So it looks like there is some movement on these within the Natural Health Products Directorate and we may be seeing some abbreviated labeling standards shortly. Probiotics, again, are on hold. Uh, there is movement, again, in revising the probiotics monograph, which will be modified to include strain-specific claims. The general claim for probiotics is expected to be moved to a labeling standard. Again, energy beverages on hold. Food like NHPs are still looking for a suitable home. There hasn't been any movement in terms of regulatory amendments on the food side that would help to accommodate food like NHPs. So they're sort of in a, in a limbo as well. The one thing with these classic products, even though they are not actively being reviewed, you can still submit your application and you will still be eligible for an exemption number 180 days after you have uh, re received your acknowledgement acceptance letter assuming that you don't meet any of the risk criteria. So you can continue to submit these applications and eventually get an exemption number uh, pending guidance coming from the National Health Products Directorate. Again, Schedule F, uh, the industry has been eagerly anticipating the, the movement on the Schedule F amendments, specifically the removal of uh, the first uh, four ingredients and then the use of the second category with qualifiers We've been told first it was January and February for the first group, uh, the ones that would be removed entirely from Schedule F. Now we're looking at February, and at that time it was in with, within weeks is the current comment on we sh when we should expect to see some movement. Again, the second group are the ones that would remain on Schedule F but with qualifiers. 
So this would allow for some over-the-counter use. Again, we've been told within weeks we should see movement on these amendments. However, now with the impending federal election, we're just trying to get some confirmation as to whether these regulatory amendments will be put completely on hold or whether they can continue to move forward in this uh, time of indecision. So we will let you know once we've got that confirmed whether it will continue to move forward. And Lovastatin, just because there was significant discussion and differences of opinion on how to move forward, this has been put into a separate package and under discussion as to how it will move forward in terms of regulatory amendments. Mm -hmm. Site licensing, uh, again, the enhanced risk-based approach to site licensing is being worked on. There is a small working group of technical experts that's been convened, approximately six members of industry. Uh, their working group is being chaired by Michael Wiseman, who has come on an executive exchange program from the Therapeutic Goods Association in Australia. He is here until August of this year. They're busy working on a concept paper, uh, which hopefully will be released for consultation with stakeholders in April of this year is sort of what we're looking at. Again, the, the basic premise of this is that there is a need for a, an actual on-site audit of manufacturing facilities, packaging, labeling, and importing association uh, activities uh, in order to get your site license. So the need for a third-party audit, again, being a risk-based approach, they're looking at products that are sterile. They would need to be audited by a Health Canada, Canada inspector, whereas non-sterile products would be able to be audited by a third party uh, audit, whether it's a consultant or another type of association group. So again, we're looking for this concept paper to be released for stakeholder consultation, hopefully within the next month or so. The Natural Health Products Directorate Program Advisory Committee, also known as PAC, again made up of stakeholders, industry stakeholders, academia, healthcare, uh, representatives, consumer advocates. Their last meeting was in January of 2011. Their key discussion points were compliance and enforcement. Sorry, that should be compliance and enforcement, not seven enforcement. They're also looking at the standards of evidence, the revised guidance documents, and testing requirements. Their next meeting is in May, and at that time it's expected that NHPD will pre be presenting their revised standards of evidence document to PAC for their comment. However, it's uh, We've heard that there's not going to be any significant changes to the content of the standards of evidence document. It's mainly clarification of what the, what's in there now. So increasing transparency and clarification to stakeholders. In terms of communications, the most recent one that has come out of Health Canada is with the alteration of health products. We continue, continue to see numerous recalls in the media with natural health products that have been adulterated uh, either with undeclared ingredients and or active pharmaceutical drugs and particularly prescription drugs. Some of these include uh, the adulteration with sibutramine and fenfluramine for obesity products, weight management products, sildenafil, tadalafil, vardenafil, all being promoted in erectile dysfunction products and corticosteroids for inflammatory conditions. Again, this is not a, an issue that's uh, is limited to Canada. There has been a lot of enforcement activity within the U.S. regarding these products and also in other countries. So this was a publication that's posted on Health Canada's website just telling consumers to be aware of these types of products and what they should be looking for in legal products. So just a couple of comments on what's happening on the food side, and we are looking at these because there is applications at times to natural health products, particularly with uh, the food labeling and uh, allergens. So there are regulations amending the food and drug regulations with respect to the labeling of allergens, gluten sources, and added sulfites. These were published in Canada Gazette Part 2 in February of this year, but because of the complexity of the amendments, the effective date is August 4, 2012. So that's when industry is expected to comply with these revised regulations. Again, it's providing clarity to consumers so they can clearly identify when an allergen is present in the product. Again, requires that manufacturers clearly identify food allergens, gluten sources, and sulfites. 
either in the list of ingredients or at the end of the ingredients with the following statement contains such and such allergen. So if a product had casein in the list of ingredients, it would have to be clearly spelled out that the product contains milk, which is the priority allergen. Again, manufacturers will also be required to list components of ingredients if they contain food allergens, gluten sources, or sulfates. So for example, if a prepackaged food contains spices, that food, the spice group would be required to list any allergens, gluten sources, or sulfites present in spices. And just for your information, the priority allergens are almonds, Brazil nuts, cashews, hazelnuts, macadamia nuts, pecans, pine nuts, pistachios, or walnuts, peanuts, sesame seeds, wheat, or triticale, eggs, milk, soybeans, crustaceans, shellfish, fish, or mustard seeds. So again, just a word of caution that the Natural Health Products Directorate tends to reference food policies, particularly with respect to allergens. So you may want to be reviewing your formulations to see if you have any of these priority allergens present. There was recently a webinar presented by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada on the Food Health Claims Roadmap. This is uh, perhaps of interest to the natural health products sector. It's a guidance document to help walk or help uh, applicants walk through the process, the regulatory uh, regulatory process to determine number one whether their product is a food or a natural health product and where they can make claims and what types of claims they can make. So there's a, a multi-step process and each step incorporates activities organized under regulatory science, market and business activities. So the webinar was held at the beginning of March. There is supposed to be a second part to it towards the end of March. Uh, we'll try and find a link for you to register for the upcoming webinar, but all the information from the first session can be found at this link that you see in front of you on the screen. So there is valuable information there in terms of defining your products and identifying the best route to market. Some additional information was uh, posted on the Competition Bureau of Canada's website with regards to Product of Canada and Made in Canada claims. Again, just clarity, uh, there were guidelines posted in December in 2009, so this are just frequently asked questions, uh, providing clarification on when Product of Canada and Made in Canada terms can be used on products. Gives the guidelines. And again, this is where you can find the FAQs. We're just going to look briefly at what's happening in the United States because a lot of people are exporting to the United States. The key issues down there currently are the GMP inspections. Uh, the Good Manufacturing Practices regulations came into force in 2007 with a three-year transition window to accommodate the needs of small, medium, and large manufacturers. Again, the premise is the same to make sure that what's on the label is what's in the bottle and that the product is not adulterated. Now that the regulations are to be fully implemented, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has begun doing inspections. To date, there have been 483 inspection reports and subsequent warning letters issued. You can find these all on the FDA website and I'll provide a link in the next slide. The points of interest here, though, are the most common deficiencies that they're finding, those being lack of identity testing, failure to establish specifications for both raw materials and finished products, inadequate or lack of batch or master manufacturing records, and a lack of justification for reduced finished product testing. So these are the challenges that they're uh, coming across in the United States. Lack of QC involvement and um, numerous processes and procedures, lack of documentation for supplier qualification. I, I, the, the main comment coming out of this is that manufacturers, whether they're big or small, have not been prepared for the, the GMPs. They've implemented some of the measures, but they haven't fully complied with the requirements. So just a reiteration that the onus is on the manufacturer to ensure the quality right from the raw material to the finished product. Raw material suppliers don't fall under these GMPs, but they will be encompassed by HACCP, which is being implemented across the food industry in the U.S. under the Food Safety Modernization Act. 
again, that you can get a good overview of what's happening in the United States with respect to dietary supplements by going to the Food and Drug Administration's warn, uh, website and looking up the warning letter. Everything is fully disclosed, so if a company receives a warning letter or a 483 inspection notice, it's all posted on the website. Some of the activities that are incurring in the U.S., again, are with regards to adulterated products, similar to in Canada, and as well, the FDA is looking more closely at claims associated with dietary supplements. Uh, the other in, uh, area of interest is the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was passed at the end of December. This applies to food manufacturing premises. Dietary supplements are exempt if they're complying with the dietary supplement GMPs, but as I mentioned, other food, uh, food manufacturing premises, and create, including raw material manufacturers, will be expected to comply with HACCP requirements. So hazard analysis critical control point programs need to be implemented. As well, under the Food Safety Modernization Act, there's, uh, it gives the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, the ability to mandate recalls and to shut down facilities if there is a public health risk. There'll be fees for reinspection. Again, there will be inspections as well as foreign uh, manufacturing facilities as well as domestic facilities. And if you are a foreign manufacturer and you refuse to let the FDA in for an inspection, they will put an import alert out at the border and your product will not be allowed into the U.S. So you really need to, to let them have access to your food manufacturing plant if you're exporting to the U.S. Again, the main question with this is whether the FDA uh, U.S. government has sufficient funding to fully implement the provisions of the Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, another area of interest is a voluntary stability testing guidance document that has been issued in the United States. It was a working group was convened under the NSF. Under the NSF DBA, which is a subsidiary of NSF International, they convened a working group of industry experts and put together this guidance document. So although there's no requirement for an expiry date on dietary supplements, if you do put an expiry date on it, then the FDA expects that you will have valid scientific data to support that. And this document will give you the guidance as to how to develop that information. So you can find this guidance document the Voluntary Stability Testing Guideline for Dietary Supplements on the NSF's website. And again, the link is there at the bottom. And the last thing in terms of the U.S. is they revised their U.S. dietary guidelines. Again, these are similar to Canada's Guide to Healthy Eating. Within the U.S., the main focus on their dietary uh, eating patterns is on tackling the obesity problem. So looking at salt, fat, and sugar reduction. They've also looked at a few supplements, promoting the use of folic acid in the prevention of neural tube defects for women of uh, childbearing age, recommendations for crystallized vitamin B12 for persons over 50 years of age, iron supplementation for all pregnant women. Uh, they have not gone so far as to recommend a multivitamin saying that there's insufficient evidence to suggest that multivitamins can insist, assist in the primary prevention of chronic disease for the healthy American population. But they are looking at targeted supplements such as vitamin D and calcium uh, for bones and minimizing the risk of osteoporosis. So they are finding some use for supplements. So that wraps up this part of today's presentation. We do have a guest speaker, as I mentioned, who is Mr. Joel Toller. Joel is a partner with Gowling LaFleur Henderson, and he's just going to provide us with some insight into the Consumer Product Safety Act. So I'll turn it over to Joel. Thanks very much, Ann, and thanks very much for that uh, great presentation you just put on. Uh, for those of you who are um, aware, the, uh, the new uh, Canada Consumer Product Safety Act is uh, set to uh, uh, go into force on June the 20th, 2011. This is the result of an original Bill C-52, which was introduced at the same time as Bill C-51 was, went through Bill C-6 and then Bill C-36, which was passed 
last December, but as I mentioned, it will be in effect on June the 20th, 2011. We don't yet know what the regulations are going to look like. Not sure that they'll be in place by the time the Act actually comes into force. Uh, but we do know that some of the regulations that deal with the uh, previous Hazardous Products Act will be transitioned over and fall under the new Canada Consumer Product Safety Act. The CCPSA moves away from regulation of specific products as it was uh, provided for in the Hazardous Products Act to a more generalized uh, class. Uh, the uh, CCPSA defines the class of products to be consumer products, which includes all products, parts, and accessories, including packaging obtained for non-commercial uses by an individual. Exempted products, though, those that being products that are not covered by the new CCPSA are foods, drugs, cosmetics, devices, and of course natural health products. Um, interestingly, there is a set of regulations under the Hazardous Products Act which are going to be transitioned over to the CCPSA which deal with carbonated beverage container regulations. It's, it's kind of odd to see uh, regulations dealing with the packaging of a food to fall within under the CCPSA when the CCPSA is not intended to deal with food. So uh, we're going to need some clarification exactly on what's going to happen with respect to packaging, shall we say, for these products. They weren't intended to apply, so um, the question is out. We'll wait for an answer. The CCPSA will cover a great number of products than the Hazardous Products Act. It's going to prohibit the sale of unsafe products. It's going to support establishing safety of a product, and it's going to require incident reporting and also require product recalls. The CCPSA basically prohibits the manufacture, import, sale, or advertisement of a product that is considered to be a danger to human health. Danger to human health uh, must represent an unreasonable danger for normal and foreseeable use now or in the future. So, in other words, uh, if you adequately label your product in a way that will provide for its safe use, even though it's a dangerous product, say a chainsaw, then it would not be considered to be a dangerous product. However, if your labeling instructions are inadequate, then you will run into problems and your product will be offside the CCPSA. There is a consultation document out which uh, suggests that one must not only look at the primary use but also any foreseeable misuse of the product in considering whether or not your product is a danger to human health. In addition uh, to uh, those uh, prohibitions, you're not able to uh, um, uh, sell a uh, consumer product that's the subject or of a recall, nor are you able to sell a product that's subject to an action, an order by uh, the minister. Turning to some of the specific provisions in the Act, the minister can require a manufacturer or an importer to conduct studies and or gather information to establish the safety of the consumer product and its compliance with the CCPSA. There does not appear to be a limit as to the number of studies that one may be required to carry out or in the breadth of the data gathering. This could be extremely costly for anyone that is that is uh, required to undertake either the conducting of these studies or the gathering of the information. There doesn't appear to be any provision in the Act that would allow one to get out of having to do this uh, enormous task uh, based on removing the product from the marketplace. So it doesn't look like even if you take the product out of the marketplace, you would be relieved of uh, of having to conduct those tests or to gather the information. There is also now under this Act incident reporting, much like you see for NHPs or drugs. Uh, there is now incident reporting for, uh, for uh, consumer products. They're based on worldwide occurrences that could cause death or serious adverse health effects. Serious adverse health effects aren't defined in the Act, but there is a, there is a uh, consultation document out which suggests that it's anything that, basically it's anything that could give rise to the requirement for medical or surgical intervention to alleviate uh, what has happened. Uh, in, in, in addition, not only would a uh, serious adverse health effect 
have to actually ensue, but could reasonably be foreseen to ensue from an occurrence. So a person may not be hurt, but nonetheless, it would be considered to be an incident. An example would be a spark or a battery overheats and starts a fire that burns down a house. Nobody happened to be home at the time, but it's reasonably foreseeable that someone could have been home. As such, that's considered to be a... uh, an incident for which reporting is required. Incidents could arise from defects in, in, the, in the product itself or a design flaw. It could arise from inadequate or incorrect labeling or instructions, or it could also be considered to be an, uh, an incident where you're a- asked by another governmental entity to recall a, the product anywhere else in the world. So a recall anywhere else in the world is likely going to require a, a, an incident report in Canada. The basic incident reporting requires a report to uh, up the chain, shall we say, of supply. So um, a retailer is required to uh, to report to whom they bought the product from. The distributor is required to report who they brought it, uh, bought it from all the way up to the importer and or manufacturer. A report is required within two days of becoming aware of uh, the incident, and that report is required to be sent, as I mentioned, up the chain, shall we say, to the next, to the person whom the, the person bought the product from. And also, you're required to give any other information that you have at the same time, and that report is also to be sent to Health Canada. Within 10 days, the importer and manufacturer must also provide a more fulsome analysis and corrective action. Experience would suggest that it's going to take a lot longer than 10 days to do what would normally be done to describe and to deal with an incident, and that would be a root cause analysis, health hazard evaluation, and corrective action. So in the event that you find yourself in such a situation, you'd want to get on to Health Canada and indicate to them that you're going to need more than 10 days to provide that final definitive report. Um, You'll probably have to put something in at the end of the 10 days, but with the understanding that you're going to follow it up after that. Health Canada has developed an electronic form to aid in the reporting. There is also a requirement now under the CCPSA for record keeping. In order to improve the ability to remove dangerous products, all sellers must keep records for at least six years from the end of the year in which Either the product was bought by the person required to keep records or sold by the person who's required to keep records. Retailers must keep records on whom they purchased the product from and the location and dates from where the product was sold, just the location of where the product was sold and its date. Manufacturers and importers must keep the name and address of whom they sold the products to. And also there is uh, an indication in the Act that there, that importers are going to be required to file additional prescribed forms within the time frame set out in the regulations or by the time of importation. Health Canada is going to expect a system of record keeping uh, to be put in place which will facilitate a recall. Inspectors under the CCPSA will have similar powers as that exists under the Food and Drugs Act. That's the ability to go on premises without a warrant, assuming it's not a dwelling house, and seize product where there is a a believed or uh, non-believed perceived breach of the CCPSA. All the inspector has to do is want to investigate whether or not um, a product is covered by the CCPSA and whether it's in compliance with the CCPSA. The minister, as I mentioned earlier, can order recalls and also issue orders. If the person does not comply with a recall or an order, then the minister can carry out at the cost and expense of the person who is the subject of the order, either the recall or the actions under the order. Recalls and orders by the minister can be challenged for review, but the recall or the order normally would proceed unless the adjudicator decides otherwise. The adjudication is required to be heard over 30 days, but the adjudicator can extend that 30-day period for another 30 days. So even though one might win at the end of the day on an adjudication, effectively you'll probably lose because the recall and order will have already been complied with. The minister also has the power to issue interim orders and seek an injunction. Penalties have been increased to $5 million. Due diligence is a defense unless the person has acted knowingly. Officers and directors who participate or acquiesce are also liable. There is an administrative penalty system where due diligence is not a defense and the penalties are much less. They're up to about $25,000. So 
The CCPSA is going to cover more products than it did previously under the Hazardous Products Act, than was covered under the Hazardous Products Act. It's going to prohibit the sale of dangerous products. It will require incident reporting, and when requested by the minister, studies will need to be conducted to establish safety and compliance with the CCPSA. Recalls and orders can be issued, and increased penalties and powers are the name of the uh, uh, the name of the game. So uh, be prepared. Keep in touch and uh, watch out for what's coming. Get yourself ready. Thanks very much, Anne. Thank you very much, Joel, for that excellent overview of the Tumor Product Safety Act. It makes the uh, natural health products not look, regulations not look so bad in comparison. And uh, thank you to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. If I could just ask you please to take a moment to complete the survey link on the right, uh, uh, the chat screen, if you would please complete it, and then please join us for our next regulatory update on Wednesday, June the 22nd. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.